So we're delighted to welcome Alison to deliver this opening plenary for the MedSoc 2023 conference. Alison is a long-term MedSoc attendee and um, began her career as a hospital pharmacist and then trained to be a sociologist through a Department of Health funding stream, which sounds amazing to have that. Um, she got her PhD from the University of Nottingham and following a British Council CIMO visiting fellow at the University of Helsinki, returned to Nottingham for more than 25 years, becoming Professor of Language, Medicine and Society in 2010. In October 2023, Alison will take up a post as Professor of Language, Health and Society at Manchester Metropolitan University. Her research has focused on how healthcare interaction actually gets done in practice in clinics, hospital wards, GP surgeries, or anywhere that healthcare is delivered in the UK and abroad. And she's used mostly conversation analysis. She has edited the journal Sociology of Health and Illness, served on the MedSoc Committee and the ASA Ethnomethodology and Conversation Analysis Section Committee. And since 2006 has been advisory editor, Medical Sociology, for social science and medicine. She's led doctoral training centres, focusing on PGR research training and supervised more than 30 PhD students working in the sociology of health and illness. In 2012, she was awarded a Lord Deering Award for teaching excellence. In 2015, she was elected a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, and she was the first sociologist to participate in the Academy of Medical Sciences Future Leaders in Innovation enterprise and research program. She was appointed to the ESRC Strategic Advisory Network in 2021. Professor Pilnick's plenary, entitled What's Wrong with Patient-Centered Care, explores topics from her 2022 book, Reconsidering Patient-Centered Care Between Autonomy and Abandonment, which has been shortlisted for this year's FSHI Book Prize, and her popular presentations on this topic at recent MedSoc conferences. Today, she will present this work exploring how we can move beyond a binary of control and reflecting on the role of sociologists in researching policy and healthcare professionals' agendas. Thank you, Alison. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Jo. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to have been asked to, to give this plenary. Not least because what I realised over the summer is that this is my 30th MedSoc anniversary. So I, I first came to this conference in, in 1993. And I think apart from one year when I'd just given birth, and then as somebody just reminded me in, in the cafe just now, one year when one of my other children was having their first day at school, I think I've been every year since then. MedSoc's always been my favourite conference to come to. And having been on the committee in the, in the really dim and distant past, I know all the hard work that goes into making it the kind of conference that it is with the, with the kind of feel that it has. And so I know that, that I and, and, and all, all of you in the lecture theatre today are, are very grateful to the committee for the work they've done to, to make that happen this year. It also means that I've seen some amazing plenaries over the years. And, and what's that, what that is mostly making me feel is really, really nervous. So I'm, I'm not sure that I've ever been more terrified in my life than I am at this moment. But I'm going to try very hard to live up to the very high standard that's been set by, by previous MedSoc plenaries over the, year, over the years. So what I'm going to talk about draws on work that I have been doing over, over those 30 years. So all of that work has used sociological methods with the aim of trying to improve communication between healthcare professionals and their patients or clients. In all of that time, none of my previous projects have been specifically about patient-centered care, but it's always been there on the periphery because all the settings that I've worked in have had PCC as an implicit or quite often an explicit aim. So while I've been analyzing data for other purposes, while I've been analysing data for other purposes, I've always been interested in, in what happens when people try and do patient-centred care, how it plays out in practice. And, and increasingly, I'd kind of been noticing difficulties or, or problems that arose when people were trying to put PCC into practice. And so I was squirrelling these, these instances and these clips away. Um, 
But just as I've been interested in it for a long time, it also took me a really long time to interest a funder in it. So several failed attempts at that. And so I'm very grateful that in the end, I had a very small amount of funding from the Academy of Medical Sciences, which enabled me to do a tiny little bit of pilot work. And then I was very fortunate to get a British Academy Senior Research Fellowship. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that support that's enabled me to do what I'll talk about today. So the first difficulty that I had when I embarked on this project was that the concept itself is really a bit slippy. So there's no universally accepted definition of patient-centred care. And because of that, and apologies if I'm telling some of you things that you already know, I thought it might be helpful to start just with a little bit of history. So there's not much that is generally accepted when you come to definitions of patient-centred care, but what is, I think, generally accepted is that the term was first coined by the psychotherapist Michael Ballant in the 1950s as part of his work with UK general practitioners. And even then, it was a bit slippy because he largely defined it in terms of what it wasn't. So he talked about it as being a contrast to, to illness-centred medicine. So he talked about it in terms of it being a move from the reductionist biological approach of, of illness-centred medicine towards what he called the pathology of the whole person. And as you might expect, consistent with his psychotherapeutic background, relational matters were really paramount in, in his work on this. So for Berlin, the doctor and the patient were engaged in what he called or what he characterised as a, as a peculiar lopsided relationship. And he characterised it in that way because he recognised the asymmetrical nature of, of the relationship in, in terms of medical knowledge, the fact that medical knowledge wasn't equally distributed across patient and doctor or client and healthcare professional. So... Obviously, sociologically speaking, and again, this will be news to probably none of you, you can trace back that asymmetrical review of, of doctor-patient relationships sociologically to Talcott Parsons and, and his work in the 1950s on the sick role. And in many ways, you can also trace the development of patient-centred care principles and patient-centred care models alongside the development of sociological thoughts on the doctor-patient relationship. So over subsequent decades, again, as, as most of you will know, Parsons' model came to be criticised. So it was criticised for the, the patient passivity or, or dependence it was seen to embed. It was also criticised for, for lack of nuance. So, you know, the, the idea that not all illnesses are the same and that different, different medical contexts and different modes of medical practice might require a more autonomous or a, or a more responsible patient, you know, according to different medical needs. And then what you see from the 70s onwards is that this work begins to move from the purely theoretical into the empirical. So Bernard Long's very famous work in the 1970s, where they audio recorded GP consultations, and they used those audio recordings to identify specific behaviours that they categorised as either patient-centred or doctor-centred with the idea that the, the doctor-centred ones were to be avoided and the patient-centred ones were to be aspired to. And as an example of, of something that they categorised as, as patient-centred, they talked about the use of open questions as, as being a patient-centred practice. And then through the late 70s and 80s, there's quite a body of influential sociological work which frames the doctor-patient relationship primarily in terms of a conflict or a struggle. So I'm thinking here particularly of, of Mischler's conceptualisation of, of the conflict between the life world and the medical world. 
And I'm also thinking about other work which, which explain that, that struggle or that lack of mutuality as a function of the clinician's role in, in relation to other aspects of society. So, for example, capital in the work of white skin or, or patriarchy in the work of Oakley. And why this work was really important, I think, is that it, it brought ideas about medical paternalism to a much wider audience and it highlighted it as a problem that, that needed to be solved. So, at the same time as this, and again, as, as many of you will be well aware, medical practice itself was also being reshaped quite significantly by the application of principle-based moral theories. And autonomy, as expressed through patient choice, and the attendant discussion of patient rights that goes alongside that discussion of autonomy, is particularly prominent in those bioethical framings. But the difficulty with principle-based moral theories is that principles can conflict. And notably, patient autonomy, patient choice, and clinician beneficence, the idea of acting in a patient's best interests, are two principles that potentially conflict in that bioethical framework. And I highlight that really just because I, I want to make the point that, that a bioethical approach also feeds into that kind of framing of, of medicine as a struggle, as a struggle between things that aren't easily reconciled. And that really feeds through into more modern expositions of, of patient-centred care. So from the 1980s onwards, from within the medical profession, you begin to see two things. You begin to see patient-centred care promoted as an approach in its own right. And you also see it promoted as a way or a means of addressing this struggle or this conflict. So the idea of patient-centred care as a, as a clinical approach or a clinical method comes from the work of, of Joseph Levenstein and colleagues from the University of Western Ontario in Canada. And they explicitly say that this is a method for addressing the conflict of agendas. And this idea of fundamental conflict is also reflected in expositions of patient-centred care that conceptualise it as a means by which patients can regain control, where, where that control has been improperly impeded. So, for example, the, the Health Foundation, the, the UK charity and funding body, note that there are a range of ways of, of defining patient-centred care, and I'll, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But they say that what underpins or what links all these different ways of, of defining or approaching it is that all of these approaches share an aim to return the control of health and care to patients. So before I turn to my own analysis, I just want to say something quick about terminology. So I'm using the term patient-centred here, and I know the term person-centred is also used. And also the two are sometimes used completely interchangeably. So particularly if you track different versions of NHS policies, what you can often see is that the word patient has been replaced by the word person in those policies, but with no other change to the policy at all. So it's, it's literally just find and replace the word. And I think that's a bit problematic because the two terms have got quite different roots. So the term person-centred originates in the work of the psychologist Carl Rogers. So it denotes a particular kind of therapeutic approach within psychotherapy where the focus is very much on the client's subjective worldview. But as Nicholas Rose has illustrated so well, vocabularies taken from therapeutic contexts are increasingly used across a much wider range of practices and settings. 
And that, I think, is problematic because while it's widely accepted that an individual has privileged access to their own inner feelings and their own inner thought processes, and that's what the basis of, of psychotherapeutic work generally is, it's also generally accepted that there's not usually an equal distribution of clinical knowledge between a healthcare professional and their patient or client. And indeed, that was one of the key features of, of Berlin's original exposition of this, the idea of the, the lopsided relationship. So I think that's one reason why using the terms as if they were completely interchangeable is problematic. I think the other is that personhood as a philosophical concept in the way that people like Kit would use it and write about it, and patienthood as a practical concept aren't straightforwardly substitutable. So all of that is a really long-winded way of saying that I'm using the term patient and I'm, and I'm sticking to the term patient. And that's not because I don't know that person-centred care exists, but it's just that I don't think the two can be straightforwardly swapped in that way. So, as I've said, there's no universal agreed definition of patient-centred care or no universally agreed way of measuring it. You'll no doubt all also be familiar with the term shared decision-making, and, and that has a slightly, slightly strange and slightly imperfectly overlapping relationship with patient-centred care. So, so for some definitions or expositions of patient-centred care, but not all of them, shared decision-making is the defining characteristic. So you can't have patient-centred care if you don't have shared decision-making. So it's a kind of, again, that's something that's sometimes used as a synonym, but is a bit of an imperfect synonym. So I knew when I started this that, that there were lots of definitions, lots of models, I wasn't quite prepared for how many there were. And so the Health Foundation, in, in their report on patient-centred care, say that there are more than 160 definitions and measurement tools in common use. So I don't quite know how they're defining common use. But what I guess is fairly obvious, you know, it, it doesn't take a genius to work out that if there's 160 different ways of looking at this, they're probably not all looking at the same thing or measuring the same thing. And so it's then not a surprise that you see researchers who have applied different tools to the same consultations and come up with quite different results. So depending on, on which model or, or which approach you're using to score your consultation, a consultation, the same consultation can be judged patient-centred or, or not patient-centred. So that was one thing that surprised me. But the thing that actually surprised me most was to do with my own naive assumptions. And you'll probably all laugh at me now because you probably all know this, but I didn't know this. So, so one of the things that I assumed when I was first interested in this area was that given the pervasiveness of, of patient-centred care in healthcare, the evidence base for it must be pretty strong. Because I naively assume that that's how healthcare policy gets made. I thought, you know, you, you collect the evidence and then you make the policy based on that evidence. But when you go looking for that evidence, it's actually remarkably slight. So, as you'd expect, there are huge numbers of studies looking at individual interventions in, in particular contexts or particular settings. But if you collect those together and you, you look at the reviews of those studies, the evidence is actually, it's actually pretty mixed. So there are three particular reviews that, that I want to draw your attention to here because they, they kind of represent the biggest or the most systematic attempts to, to pull this literature together. So there's Lewin and colleagues, 2001, Cochrane Systematic Review of, of Patient-Centred Care Interventions. There's the update of that that was done by Dwaminu and colleagues in, in 2012. 
And then there's Shay and Lafarta's 2015 review of shared decision-making interventions. And, and I include that one because, as I've said, for some, for some contexts and some authors, shared decision-making is treated as the defining characteristic of, of patient-centred care. But if you look at what they find, so Lewin and colleagues found some evidence for improvement in patient satisfaction, but none for improvement in health behaviours or health outcomes. Duamina and, and colleagues in their 2012 update found positive effects on the consultation, but still mixed effects for overall patient satisfaction and mixed effects for, for health behaviours and, and health outcomes. And Shea and Lafarta in the, in the most recent review, the Shared Decision-Making Review, found no impact on patient behavioural or health outcomes. So, at best, it seems that these interventions sometimes improve satisfaction, but the evidence that they improve health behaviours or, or health outcomes is, is kind of mixed or non-existent, dependent on, on which review you look at. And in fact, when you look in more detail at the, the conclusions of these reviews, the only thing that patient-centred care interventions can be shown to do consistently is to improve the practice of patient-centred care as measured by that particular intervention. And that doesn't seem to me to be a fantastically helpful circularity. So we've kind of arrived at this position where, where patient-centred care has become a mark of quality of care in the absence of, of any real evidence for how it improves that quality of care. And also in a position where, and, and this is a quote from Stephen Buto, the American medical humanities scholar, where the burden of proving the rightness of it has fallen not on proponents of, of patient-centred care, but on people who are suggesting that, that maybe something else should happen. So that raises the question, as to whether patient-centred care is a principle that's important in its own right, or whether it's only important as a means of improving care. And the case for it being important on its own grounds or for its own sake rests really on moral grounds. And you might say, well, that's fine. You know, that, that's a good moral principle to have. But I suppose the difficulty then is that transforming a moral principle from policy into practice, you know, how you do that is opaque from the perspective of policy directives. And it's also a bit problematic from the perspective of studying healthcare interaction. So studying healthcare interaction is, is what I did. And I want just to tell you briefly what, what, kind of data, what kind of data I had and, and how I analysed it. So I used my collection of some audio, but mostly video recordings of healthcare encounters. I won't call them all consultations because that's not how they were all badged. But from a wide range of, of health and social care settings. So that involved a, a wide range of healthcare professionals, so different kinds of doctors, different kinds of nurses, physios, pharmacists, speech and language therapists, genetic counsellors, midwives, also all sorts of, of different healthcare professionals. For some of those data, I had permission to reanalyse. For others, I had to go back and, and seek that permission to use it for, for different purposes. Most of the data was from UK context, but had a little bit of French data, a little bit of German data, and some data from Hong Kong. As I already said, none of it was collected specifically for the purpose of, of this project. So it came from projects that had looked at advice giving or risk communication or 
use of English as a second language or initial referrals to gender clinics or all kinds of data for or all kinds of projects. But all of those projects had been interested in, in health communication in some way. I'd previously analysed it using the sociological method of conversation analysis and, and that's how I reanalysed it because I was interested in, in how communication happens in real time rather than in what people say they do or in what policies say that they should do. So even, even with the luxury of, of 50 minutes in a plenary, I've got not a lot of time to present actual examples from my data set. So if anybody's interested, that there are plenty more examples in the, in the book that Joe referred to at the beginning. So I think there are some flyers around if anybody is interested in, in following that up. But I'll just, I'll just pick on a couple of examples here. My central argument is that there's a mismatch between the aspects of communication that, that patients orient to as problematic in consultations or healthcare encounters and the policy initiatives that have been designed to, to fix those problems. So the problem is pretty much always conceptualised as one of inadequate training. If only we trained healthcare staff more or somehow better in patient-centred care, then we'd see different results. But I think it's much more complex than that. And I think it's been misconceptualised because of a lack of understanding about how interaction in general and healthcare interaction in particular works in actual practice. So sociologists have been arguing for a long time that there can be good organisational reasons for what might on the face of it look like bad healthcare practice, bad in inverted commas. And you see that, you know, in the sense that something might not live up to patient-centred care ideals because there's a, there's a priority focus being placed on something like safety or, or on a wider public health concern. But to stretch that title of, of Harold Garfinkel's famous paper just a little bit further, I think there aren't only good organisational reasons, there are also good interactional reasons. And, and so that's what I want to talk about. So I said I'll pick up just on a couple of examples. And one of the specific examples that recurs time and again in my data is the difficulty that you've got when you're trying to reconcile patient autonomy or patient choice in relation to meaning making. So there's a lot of existing conversation analytic research that shows that, that with regard to descriptions and assessments in talk, a description of something isn't treated as complete with reference to that description alone. So instead, what you need is a, is a summary, a conclusion or a point that gives some kind of summary of the sense that's intended. Because if you don't have that, the listener has to work out for themselves how it should be interpreted in the absence of the additional knowledge that the teller has. So the American sociologist Doug Maynard has done extensive work on the delivery of diagnosis. And, and one of the things that he's shown is how that telling is a, is a key part of the diagnostic sequence. But what I saw time and again in my data across a range of different settings is healthcare professionals backing away from that meaning making for fear that it will undermine patient autonomy and, and patient choice. So I've got one example here that I'll, I'll just talk you through. I didn't dare load the actual audio in case it caused the whole presentation to malfunction. So I'm afraid you have to put up with my poor amateur dramatic skills now while I read it out to you. This is an extract from a consultation between a specialist nurse and a pregnant woman in an antenatal clinic in Hong Kong. So the woman has had initial 
antenatal screening, which has suggested that her pregnancy is at increased risk of, of fetal anomaly. And she's been called back to the clinic to discuss those results and to lay out what the options for, for further investigations or testing are for her, should she, should she wish to take them. So this extract comes quite a long way into the consultation. And so the specialist nurse has already talked at some length um, about what the options are. So she's, she's talked about the possibility of, of not doing anything else at all. She's talked about the possibility of having an amniocentesis, or she's talked about the possibility of having a more detailed ultrasound scan and, and working out where to go from there. So we come to the bit of the consultation where the midwife, the specialist nurse is, is kind of moving towards decisions. And so she says, or can you decide today? Or you want, you prefer to talk to your husband first. The woman says, it's okay, which is the best for me? I don't know. Nurse says, nah, see, nah, see. Now, whether you want to have the, the first thing is, you decide you want to have test or no test, okay? And the second thing is whether you want to have direct test or indirect test. Whether you want to have an accurate test or whether you want to have a safe test. If you want to have a safe test, then you need to undergo the screening test. But if you think that I want to have an accurate test, then you need to undergo the, 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 the other test. There's a 10 second pause. And you know, for those of you who, who study face-to-face -face interaction, you'll know that that's pretty much an eternity if two people are, are talking to one another. During that time, the woman's looking down at the, at the papers that you know, they're mostly her medical records that are on the table in front of the nurse. And then, I'm not, I'm not going to attempt to, <laughs> to recreate what, what she does, but, but I can best describe that noise to you as a kind of wry chuckle. So, so much that I could say about, about that data extract. I think what's clear is that what the woman is asking for is some kind of professional opinion about how to proceed from here so she's not asking or she's not indicating that she hasn't understood the information that's been given up until this point she's asking which is best for her but the nurse treats it as a request for for more information and so she restates at length the things that she's already said except that this time what she's doing, rather than, rather than talking about amniocentesis and ultrasound, she's talking about direct and indirect and accurate and safe and so on. But what I hope is that this gives you some indication of, of why the subtitle of my book is, is Between Autonomy and Abandonment. Because while I think it's absolutely clear that the client is given autonomy to make her own decision, it's equally clear that she's not receiving that autonomy with unbridled enthusiasm in that moment. So that's one example. And I just want to show an example from another category of, of things. So lots of patient-centered care models and measurement tools consist one way or another of, of checklists of things that, that are either seen as patient-centered or not patient-centered. And, and so things are rated by, by scoring those things. But I think there are problems in, in assuming that goods and bad in inverted commas, features of healthcare encounters, can be identified in that way, a priori and devoid of context. So as well as autonomy, Another common item on patient-centered care checklists is that the patient or client should be allowed to set their own agenda. So patient or client-led agendas are good. But I have to say that they don't work in my data. So again, I've got an example. Again, you'll have to put up with me reading it. And I'm sorry that this one looks weird on the screen. I was trying to make it all fit on one slide, which has done funny things with the, with the line formatting. But this is a consultation between a patient and a clinical geneticist in, a, in an outpatient clinic. So the patient has a family history of Huntington's disease and has had some initial conversations with, uh, with their GP 
about whether they might want to be tested uh, to find out what their own Huntington's status is. So at this point in time, they don't know it. The GP has made a referral to the clinical geneticist and, and, and that's how the clinical geneticist opens this, this consultation. So there's a bit of greeting stuff that isn't shown here. But then you get grand, of course. Dr Smith said in the letter that um, your late father had Huntington's disease and that you'd thought things through and I think he prompted things a little bit when he asked you some leading questions. The patient says, yeah, and, but the geneticist continues. And you thought things through and you just wanted to find out a little bit more and look ahead uh, and consider the pros and cons of sort of uh, what the next step might be. So it's a kind of pretty vague preamble up until that point, which just explains what the, what the geneticist knows about the person who's, who's sat in front of them, who they've, they've not met before. And then you get, can you just ask... Have you got uh, extra questions that if, if you want to add to the obvious list that... And the patient says, mm, not, not that I think of at the moment. So I have to say that there are many examples across my data sets where patients or clients in all kinds of settings are asked to set agendas. But there aren't any examples of it being successfully done in the sense that a client is able to produce an item for discussion that's both considered relevant to that meeting and hasn't already been put on the table for discussion. So quite often people will say, oh, I'd like to talk about X, and they'll get told that you can't talk about X in this meeting or, or with this particular professional. Or they'll pick up on something that's already been suggested as an agenda item by the professional that they're talking to and say, oh, yeah, I really want to talk about that. But if you don't get either of those two things, the kind of formulation that you get here is really common. So people don't just say no. They produce some kind of formulation like this one, not that I think of at the moment, that kind of provides for the fact that that they might have other items to add and that you know they just can't think of them now or they might they might do so later you know it, it preserves the possibility that, that they will do this at some point although that some point in my data very rarely comes and so i did a lot of thinking about why it is that people are producing formulations in in this kind of way because because you could just say no no i don't think so and, and move on but but you know no not that I can think of at the moment or no but I'll maybe come back to you or, or those kinds of things are, are quite common in my data and I think what they indicate is that patients are feeling some kind of accountability that this is something that they should be able to do but you know that they can't do it and they're managing the kind of face work of that by saying I can't do it now but perhaps I'll do it later or, or perhaps I'll do it in a minute so I think there are two conclusions to be drawn from that. So the first is that things that in the abstract seem like inclusive practices might not function that way in healthcare and might even sometimes be experienced as face threats. And, and I certainly think, you know, if you're constituting something as an obvious list, there is a problem. You know, there's a problem both with saying that you don't know what is on the obvious list and a problem with knowing what you then might add to it. The second thing is that patient-centred care, through the use of specific discursive practices, constitutes an ideal patient as a particular kind of subject with particular kinds of attributes. So somebody who wants to assume control of their health care and also has the intellectual and the interactional resources to be able to do that. And if you don't have that, then the promised empowerment of patient-centred care isn't easily achieved. So the problem of expertise, we seem to have reached this position where we assume that the only alternative to patient-centred care as currently espoused is a return to medical paternalism. But I think there's a big problem with this because that patient-centred care versus paternalism dichotomy 
conflates professional authority connected with status and professional expertise connected with knowledge. So there's a distinction made in the, in the philosophy even of language that I find really useful, which talks about the difference between epistemic authority and deontic authority. So simply put, epistemic authority being the right to knowledge in a particular area, and deontic authority being the right to decide what should happen on the basis of that knowledge. And the logic of choice, as the philosopher of healthcare, Anne-Marie Moll says, kind of, it works on the basis that it promises it will free patients from the patriarchal rule of professionals. But this distinction between authority based on status and authority based on knowledge, or what we might normally call expertise, is problematic, I think, because if we think about the way moral values become incorporated into healthcare and the way that that often follows in the wake of investigations into medical scandals, things like the Francis Inquiry and so on, those investigations very often conclude that, that they're, they're rooted in a culture of unchallenged medical authority related to status. Or I guess in the, you know, the relation to the, the recent Lucy Letby case, there it's managerial status. But, but the issue is status rather than knowledge. And if you examine actual consultations, what they show is how the boundaries of expertise and negotiated and determined in the moment through interaction. So you can't, kind of can't begin by treating aspects of social context, like, like power or knowledge, as exogenous immutable factors that will always belong or not belong to, to one or other party in, in healthcare interactions. And Analysis of consultation shows that, that patients often do significant interactional work to try and preserve, preserve the expertise of the professional. And if you conceptualise choice and control as discrete properties, if you treat this as a zero-sum game and you think that control can only belong to one or other party, you end up easily in a place where there is no obvious slot for that medical expertise in, in healthcare decision making. So, by downplaying or discarding professionals' epistemic authority, we can leave patients unable to make the meaning they require from their situation. Patients don't ask questions of healthcare professionals just because they can't make their mind up. They ask because they don't treat all sources of information as equivalent in decision making. And I've got lots of examples in my data, and I won't show any more detailed examples, but I've got lots of examples where, where people are trying to make decisions and they say things like, but I don't know anything about it. Or, well, what do most of your patients do? Or my particular favourite, which is, which is delivered with an eye roll that, again, I'm not sure that I can mim mimic. Yeah, but you're a learned man. <laughs> so patient-centred care places an emphasis on the epistemics of experience. But if you carry that through to its logical endpoint, you run the risk of turning healthcare issues into private concerns. They're, they're nothing but that person's individual experience. And the logical endpoint of that is either in patient abandonment or practices of affirmative care. And the patient abandonment part, I hope that I've shown through that little example, the ways in which that can be problematic. The affirmative care is a very live issue in, in the UK context at the moment in, in relation to the, the CAS review. But what the CAS review or what the interim report of the CAS review has, show, has shown is that, is that there can be a difficult relationship between the practice of affirmative care and care standards. And so either of those endpoints, if they're taken to their extreme, I think have difficulties associated with them. So to try and bring this to some conclusions, 
the promotion of, of patient control through patient-centered care, it's grounded in a, in, a, in a conflict framing, and it's also reinforced by, a, by an individualist bioethical lens, you know, so that focus on autonomy, or on individual autonomy. And it's been really interesting to me, looking through all this literature, that the idea of relational autonomy is, is largely absent from this patient-centered care literature. So Michael Gove told us we'd all have had enough of experts, but that's not borne out by looking at these interactions because expertise is, is collaboratively sought and actively constructed. And, and if it isn't there, people are asking for it, even if they don't ultimately get it. So I think if we assume the only alternative to patient-centered care is unbridled medical paternalism, we're both misunderstanding how health in, healthcare interaction works in practice, as well as conflating authority with expertise. And, and both of those things, from my perspective, are, are problematic. So, easy to stand here and criticise, I know. So, so what do I think we should do instead? Well, I think that given many years of trying to find it, hasn't found any evidence that, that or hasn't found any conclusive or convincing evidence that patient-centered care works in terms of improving health behaviors or, or health outcomes. I wonder whether we're trying to reform the wrong thing. And I wonder whether reform is better directed at, at trying to consider how professional expertise can be rehabilitated civilly and productively for, for the benefit of patients. I think that, I certainly don't mean to suggest that, that communication or that I think communication is unimportant. What I actually think is that it's probably even more fundamentally important than even proponents of patient-centered care recognize. And I certainly don't think that, that everything about patient-centered care is bad. You know, there are, there are common components of, of common definitions of patient-centered care that include things like active listening or eliciting expectations that are absolutely important practices. But what I think is we need to study interaction or communication in its own right, rather than doing it through checklists that assume we can determine in advance which features are, are good or bad and, and see whether those are, are present or absent. I've just realized that I've missed a point off the slide there because I also think that, that we need to recognize the importance of culture in understanding practitioner client relationships because it's really difficult to see how patient-centered care could be implemented in, in low or middle income countries or, or even low income settings in high income countries because in those settings patient choice is probably no more than an illusion anyway and, and so to pretend that it's anything more than that I don't think is helpful so that suggests that, that we need to move a bit beyond the restriction of models that are rooted in, in Western doctor-patient encounters and to think a bit more about the diversity and, and complexity of healthcare. And then sometimes when I talk about this work, people say to me, oh, so you don't think patient experiences are important then? And that couldn't be further from the truth. So I think they're of paramount importance but I think there are better ways of incorporating them into healthcare than through the obsessive scoring or evaluating of, of individual consultations. So how do we use it on a more fundamental level in co-design and co-production to make sure that it's, it's properly elicited, properly incorporated, properly utilized? So the elephant in the room here is really the complicity of social science in all of this. And so I have to put my hands up and say that the complicity of social science is a phrase that I've nicked from David Armstrong. Uh, he used it in a kind of related but, but different context. But I just want to say something about medical sociology just to, just to finish. So the sociologist Andrew Abbott argues that the breadth and reach of sociology make it particularly susceptible to co-option by other disciplines. And so there's a bit of a 50s theme going on here. I'm back to the 1950s again. I'm talking about, talking about Strauss and the distinction that he made between the sociology of medicine and sociology in medicine. And in making that, 
in making that distinction, Strauss was recognising, and it's long been recognised, that medicine is a discipline which might do some of that co-opting of sociology. But if sociology of medicine or sociology of medicine is, is recognised or characterised as a critical endeavour in the academic sense of that word that's undertaken from outside the discipline, where sociology in medicine is, is undertaken within it, then I'd argue that what's happened in patient-centred care is, is a clear example of the latter. So sociology has been co-opted, I think, in an attempt to bring about the delivery of patient-centred care, rather than considering whose interests that philosophy serves in the first place. And while I don't mean to suggest that it's been implemented with anything other than the best of intentions, if we think about it only from inside or from, from, from an inside the, the discipline of medicine perspective, I think we run the risk of losing some of the original purposes of sociological inquiry. So I've got a picture of a plumber on the slide there. What I think is that I don't want to be the sociological equivalent of a plumber who turns up with the sociology toolkit and tries to fix the leak in the system that somebody else already designed. I don't want to be the person who stands there whistling through my teeth and puts my hand on my hip and goes, oh, I wouldn't have designed it like that. And so what I think is that there are questions for all of us about the ways in which we use our socio sociological skills. So I don't mean to suggest that sociology in medicine is unimportant or inappropriate. I think there are absolutely times and contexts when it is. But I do want to say that you know, it's not the only way of doing medical sociology, and, and I hope it doesn't become the only way of, of doing medical sociology. So for me, the question that I'm asking myself now, having done this project, is how do I advocate for policy to be grounded in an understanding of how interactions work in practice. So given that that's not what's happened before, how can that happen now? And so I suppose what I think about now is how sociology might be used as a tool to identify and explicate practices, interactional practices, in order to bring about change. Thank you. No. Oh, okay. Just wired the other way around. So we've got time for some questions now. So questions, Hillary can come up to not Hillary, sorry, Gloria. I'm sorry. To go with raving mics and check these work. And if people put your hands up, good. Uh, thanks ever so much, um, Alison. Really, uh, really enjoyed that. I, I wondered if um, you've obviously got fantastic knowledge of your data set, and I wondered if uh, I could sort of cheekily ask, a bit like Phil Strong and the way he looked for the exceptional case in his thousands of encounters he, he, he'd observed, was there one that, that either stood out as, i.e., one that went really wrong, or one that was showed the possibility of a better dialogue? I wondered if there's something that leapt out to you that you could share with us now. Um, I mean, so in terms of, in terms of crystallising the problem, I, I do really like that first example that I shared with you from the antenatal clinic, just because I think that I'm not sure that I have ever looked at any other bit of data where there is a 10-second pause between two people like that. So you get pauses where people are doing physical examinations or, you know, the GP is typing on the computer or something else is happening. But 10 seconds where two people are just sitting looking at each other... <laughs> It is an eternity. So, so, yeah. In terms of people doing things differently, I mean, it's interesting because what I do sometimes get, people do do things differently, but they often, or professionals often then frame that in terms, of, in terms of saying that they're not really supposed to say this. Or, you know, I, you know I, well, you know, I, 
well, obviously this person isn't you, but I can tell you that somebody else who, who chose this route had X consequences or so on. So, so and that also is interesting, that, that, that people are, are kind of couching their expertise in, in ways where they suggest they shouldn't really be sharing it. So I think, yeah, that, that's interesting too. Okay, okay um, Cathy, yeah. Thanks, Alison. That was just so fabulous. Um, thank you so much. There's so much there. Um, there's a bit of a rallying cry there for conversation analysis, isn't there, in the um, we need to explicate interactional practices. And I absolutely see how, you know, the stuff you've done and other CA colleagues has actually had that transformative power. So that stuff, you know, you talked about coming here for 30 years. 30 years ago, the reason MedSoc was in September was because medical sociologists were employed in medical schools to humanise doctors and stop them telling people they had cancer in a really horrible way. And the kind of stuff you did was really helpful with, or, you know, the, that interactional, conversational stuff was really important. Um, for those of us that feel like maybe it's a bit too late to learn Jeffersonian transcription and get really stuck into CA, um, what, what, what should we be doing while you're doing those deep dives into the language structure and turn taking? Thank you, Cathy. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, so yeah, I, mean, I wondered if anybody would notice there was a little bit of a, a rallying cry for conversation analysis <laughs> built in there. But, but I suppose I think what I'm trying to say, and you know, and maybe I just kind of rushed to finish this at the end. I, that's what my version of, of sociology of medicine looks like. But there will be different. You know, I'm not meaning to suggest that that's what everybody should be doing. The, you know, the, there will be different versions of that depending on the things that people are interested in and and the skills that they have. You know, I entirely appreciate that that not everybody has the time or the inclination to spend many hours poring over over tiny little bits of of data. Um, I mean, I think. You know, for me, the, the patient experience, the co-production, the co-design work is, is really important because, because all this patient-centred work has not... Well, it increases patient satisfaction in the short term, but then it doesn't improve the way in which they rate things overall. So, so it makes them feel better about the conversation that they just had, but it doesn't make them feel better about anything else. And so that's not very satisfactory, I don't think. So there's, so there's a lot of work to be done there, and I know there's lots of people in this conference doing great work in, in that kind of field. Does that answer the question? Okay. Thank you. Um, I also really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Um, and like Cathy, I just love conversation analysis when I see experts such as you um, talk about it. But my, my question or my comment is a plea for more organisational understanding. And I've just, in 2016, I was a, I was a sociologist in medicine, actually. <laughs> I, was, I was part of the design of a whole system intervention called Care Plus, working in very deprived general practices in Glasgow. And this was an organisational intervention it paid for general practices to have more time with patients from very deprived areas, multiple problems, in, and, and with multimorbidity. It also um, had some other kinds of interventions at an individual level, and also to support the practitioners, both nurses and GPs. Mm -hmm. Now, the outcomes for that's a form of patient-centered care, because everybody assumed that the GPs and the practice nurses could do patient-centered care but it was the organisational change of more time did result in better outcomes. And in fact, what happened in the intervention group is they didn't get, their well-being did not get worse <laughs> over a 12-month period. So at least that's something, whereas in the, in the control group they did. So I guess what I'm saying is we, we are in the situation of a health system which is just about falling apart, and more time will cost... Um, is likely to help somewhat. So our study of organisations is also going to help. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And I also think, you know, it, 
it has struck me, you know, in my, in my data that sometimes you can see that what people what people are doing when they are producing interactions that would not be judged patient-centred by various tools or scores are attending to immediate issues of safety or longer-term issues like the risk that somebody might develop pressure sores or, or, or whatever it might be. So, you know, patient choices being overridden in the moment in the service of a of a longer term gain that is related to, to how an institution or, or how an organisation runs. So yeah, I absolutely take that on board. Okay. Victoria, we've got a question down 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 here. <laughs> you can put your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, again many congratulations Alison but I wanted partly to respond to, to, you know, to Kathy's question as well, which I think the, the big achievement here is the prizing a part of epistemic and daotonic authority. And I think that if, again, if we, we can be forgiven as a historical note, I mean, if we go back to the, the medical sociology of the late 60s, early 70s, and the what is involved in the critique of professional imperialism, um, you know, the illegitimate extensions of professional authority, uh, and the, the extent to which patient-centred care, as you've rightly pointed out, is, is partly in reaction to that. Um, it has, on the one hand, done away with the... Um, it, it's, it's effectively abolished that distinction. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think as recent events have been reminding us consistently, you know, medical sociology has, to some extent, taken its eye off the ball. That you know, we've, stopped try we've stopped trying to make life uncomfortable for doctors by being cri critical of, their, of the illegitimate extension of their epistemic authority into deonto deontic authority. Um, uh, so we've seen plenty of examples of that over the last three years. And, and to my mind, medical sociologists have you know, remained silent in the face of that, um, and to some extent lost the um, the kind of lost sight of those conceptual tools. And I, I, I think you know, if Kathy is asking, well, what's the bigger picture here? You know, the bigger picture is saying, look, you know, medicine is medicine is too important to be left to doctors or healthcare professionals. Um, and sociologists have genuine things to say which are independent of the task of the sociology in medicine of making, make, of you know, increasing medical control, um, of, of making life more comfortable for doctors and possibly for patients, but being prepared to say uncomfortable things about the role of medicine in society. Uh, some of which happen at an interactional level, um, and some of which else happen elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the confusion of those two, two sources of authority and your disentanglement of them, you know, if, one, if people want to take away a big picture uh, legacy from this fascinating plenary, um, I, I would suggest that that's probably what they should take away. What do you think, Alison? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that I, well, you know, I, I, thank you for saying very nice things. I'm, I'm not sure that I disagree with any of the, any of the arguments you've made. I mean, I think that, you know, I'm not saying sociology in medicine is not important. I'm just saying that it can't be the only medical sociology. Um, and I think, you know, it, I think it is a big question here, isn't it? Because, so patient-centred care doesn't improve health behaviours and it doesn't improve health outcomes. So there's a big question there about what we think the purpose of medicine in society is or, or what we want it to be. And, and so those are the kinds of questions that, that you can't ask from a, from a sociology in medicine perspective, I think. Mm -hmm. I think we've got time for one or two more questions. Have we got any? Yep, right up the back there. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a fascinating presentation. Um, my, my question may be slightly unrelated from the core of uh, uh, your, 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 your paper, but um, I'm, I'm wondering whether you see 
a place in popular culture for uh, uh, reflections on uh, patient-centered care as a model of uh, healthcare delivery. And uh, I'm, I was thinking in particular about the, la la the, 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 the second to last point uh, about the idea of whether we can identify in popular culture representations of patients, uh, patient-centered care, uh, a place to understand how healthcare interaction works in practice. I'm thinking about programming such as uh, Operation Ouch, Jordi uh, Hospital, uh, GP practice, where you see a great deal of interaction between patients and, and medical experts. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, really interesting question. I, yeah, so, so my kids are a bit too big now for Operation Out, so I'm not, <laughs> that, that I'm not so familiar with. But certainly, you know, that there, there is lots of medical interaction of, of one kind or another on, on the telly now. I think it's difficult because it's always difficult to know how heavily it's edited. Uh, you know, how heavily those interactions have been edited for broadcast. And, and certainly my suspicion is that they're sometimes quite heavily edited because, because things happen in them that don't ordinarily happen or, you know, don't typically happen in, in healthcare consultations, I think. Um, you know, ordinary talk is, is messy and it takes a long time and, and quite often people don't get the gist of each other correctly the first time and so there'll be repair and correction but but reality tv or you know the, those kinds of, of fly on the wall documentary tv programs often don't have a lot of patience with that so in some ways i think they compound the problem by by, by making things look much more much cleaner and more straightforward than they are I mean, I guess in terms of a wider cultural moment, I mean, we're kind of in a place at the moment, aren't we, where, where there is a popular position that, that the revelation of inner experience leads inexorably and, and unproblematically to, to kind of truth or authenticity. And I think that's, you know, that feeds into or is very much tied up with the, the kind of the privileging of the epistemics of experience and you know and as I said I don't think that necessarily comes from a bad place or it doesn't come from bad intentions but the problem is that ultimately it, it makes somebody's medical problem into a into a private concern and then you leave people to, to act on the basis of, of what they think or, or what they feel which might be all right in some contexts but but for the patients and clients in my data it's it's clearly not all right in lots of them okay um we've got victoria we've got one more question here and then and then we'll close the plenary hi thanks very much alison i particularly appreciated your disentangling of the knowledge on the one hand and status and expertise on the other i think that's what some of the questions have been about but i wondered um whether you'd come across examples of patients saying, what would you do if you were me? Yeah. And whether you would analyze those from a CA perspective as a sort of micro in the moment example of someone attempting to disentangle those things um, in the way that you've done theoretically. Oh gosh, good question. Yeah, so lots of those examples, what, what would you do if you were me? Generally in my data, in whatever context, that doesn't get an answer. And so where, where people tend to go from that is what do most people do? Or what do other people who've had X do? Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, the kinds of short quotes, the, the, you know, the thing I said about, you're a learned man, and the, you know, the, those kinds of things show that, that, that patients are making those kinds of distinctions, that they're not... They're not saying, tell me what to do because you're a doctor. They're saying, help me work out what to do because you know stuff about this that I don't know. And so what I need you to do is, is tell me the stuff that I don't know because I can't make a decision about this on my own. Does that answer the question? Okay. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for your terrific questions. And thank you very much to Professor Nat for Sarah's improvement. <laughs>